Hello everyone, this is Terry with Futures.io, and as always, I would like to thank you for joining us today. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome back Peter Davies of Jigsaw Trading for today's webinar, Become a Better Trader in Two Weeks. If you have questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. If you want to do this on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoy the webinar. And as always, please feel free to share, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. For trading news, events, and information, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using at Futures.io. And now, without further delay, I will hand it over to Pete, and you should get the pop-up screen, or pop-up to share your screen again. Okay, I've got that. Just give me two minutes, everybody, to get the screen share going. Okay, so you should see the screen now. Can you see that, Terry? Yes, yeah, looking very good. Okay, so... Right, welcome everybody. We are starting this webinar with what seems to be a very lofty goal to radically improve your trading in just two weeks. Now what we're going to look at is an action plan that any trader can implement, and I know that because many have, and it's for anyone who's not yet profitable or for those that are marginally profitable and not really moving forward. Now many traders have followed what I'll teach today. And the results have been a major change in their understanding of the markets, what it takes to be a trader, and where they are on the path to becoming a trader. Now, this webinar does not rely on you using any specific technique. So this is not about using order flow or any other technique. It really doesn't matter what technique you apply this to. Now, I'd like to just share why I'm doing this. Um, if you'd come to trading 15 years ago, you'd have been bombarded with lots of nonsense about magic systems that got you profitable overnight. You can still find these if you look hard enough, but traders have become a lot more savvy now, and so have the vendors. So now the pendulum has swung the other way. Now it's cool to tell people how long it will take to learn how hard trading is. But once again, there's, there's no detail given. You know, when somebody says, oh, it'll take you two years to learn to trade, there's no curriculum, there's no milestones of where you should be at points along the way. No details of how you can measure your progress. And without giving a clear path, it's kind of nonsense to say two years or three years or one year or six months. So let's take that common, you know, two years to profit that's quite popular right now. You know, it's great to hear that you can get to profit in two years. But where should you be after three months? What stage should you be at the six-month mark? You know, how do you measure your progress? How do you know a year in if you're ahead or you're behind? Well, you don't, right? Because there's no path, there's no exam, there's no certificate of accomplishment, and there's not even a participation trophy. Anyway, the key isn't that it's three months or six months or two years, because it really depends on how much time you have to spend each week, right? And it depends on your abilities as well. The key is to be aggressively moving forward and continually improving, you know, being better each week and having a, a clear cut path forward and a path for dealing with setbacks. So before we look at the two-week process, let's first think about the goals. Because when I talk to traders for the first time, I'll often ask them what the goals are. And you can tell a lot from asking this, not just, I mean, your immediate thought when you say what your goals, you maybe think, well, I bet some people are saying I want a Ferrari uh, and that kind of thing. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what you see. And I ask this question because quite often traders they sound like they've been beaten up by the market because most often they'll say things like, you know, well, in 12 months time, I'd like to be able to cover my commissions and maybe make a small profit. And they send, sound so meek. And these aren't meek people. They're just very meek when it comes to trading. Trading has, um, has roughed them up a little. It's cut their lip. You know, they don't want to say anything that will make trading come and get them again. It's like trading has become the school bully. So what they're saying is, they're quite happy to have a 12-month goal of earning less than minimum wage for, from trading. And considering how much time a lot of people put into this with no reward, they would actually be better off getting a job at McDonald's, you know, because at least they'd be out of the house meeting people. Now, from what I've seen, there are a few different end goals for traders. Obviously, we know that some people don't make it. So let's see what people are making in the industry in a very controlled environment, right? In other words, with somebody looking over your shoulder, ready to pull the plug on you if you continually lose. You know, how people in the professional environment are doing. So let's not dwell too much on the blown up accounts or the, I lost $25,000 but didn't tell my wife. 
Um, depending on the trade style, the first level of success, as bizarre as it might sound, is I'd have made money if it wasn't for those commissions. And this is very common for those in prop firms trading multi-leg spreads and quite common nowadays because there are traders, I'm not going to name the country, but anybody from there will know which country I mean. There are prop traders struggling at the moment in one country because interest rates are quite low and they're trying to trade these complex multi-leg spreads that have um, high commissions, but there's no not enough movement in the interest rate products they're trading to really, you know, for, for most of them, for the average traders to, to make money. So they're successful. They're actually um, making money on each trade, but the commissions are just killing them, right? And so that's and that's the prop world. That's not retail traders. Now, for the prop firms that are trading outright positions, you know, you're looking at in those initial first profits, a couple of hundred dollars a day, um, with the imminent threat of being moved back to sim uh, continually um, and very tight control of risk. So you're going to get moved back to sim if you violate your risk parameters. You're going to move back to sim if you have a, a bad run. OK, and it's just at that stage they threaten that when you when you move on from that, you don't you don't have that continual threat. So usually it's a single strategy with quite a narrow focus, kind of walk before you run trading. Now, as traders progress and I'm not saying everybody gets to each of these points, you know, some people are going to stop and plateau along the way. But as a trader progresses, you know, as they get better and they improve, you're looking at the two, four, five thousand dollars a day mark. Um, losing days are still quite possible, but now the trade has reached a, a level of consistency, you know, a level of success that puts them ahead of most retail traders. They've got a wider range of markets and setups, and they've got more leeway in terms of size to trade. Okay, the next level of performance is where days of around $10,000, $20,000 are quite normal. Okay, now to most retail traders, this sounds like telephone numbers, right? So they've got more size. They're, tr they're trading more instruments. They've got more trust from management. Um, they're aggressive at scanning positions. Um, they've also got the ability to switch quickly as the market changes price. It's almost like watching a crocodile. Um, they're, they're just kind of, you know, taking little chunks out of the market, taking little chunks out of the market, and then market changes pace, and they're able to quickly, you know, run with that and scan into a position. And um, you know, traders like this, um, forty, fifty thousand on a really good day. Um, not unusual at all. Now, the next level and the highest level, certainly from the traders I've spoken to, is where trades are pulling in, regularly pulling in over $100,000 a day. And in some cases, becoming a significant percentage of all trade on an individual market. So, I'll give you a couple of examples. One trader I know, he was actually 30% of the volume on one of the Singapore futures markets. Now, I remember us having a discussion because he wanted to actually trade, uh, move to the Thai Futures Exchange, and they refused him any. They wouldn't even give him one cent of volume discount. Um, and, you know, it's probably like, well, that's a problem I'm probably never going to have. Um, another trader I know got fined and banned from trading the FTSE 100 futures for pushing it around out of hours. Um, another guy that I met, um, he, was, he made about $12 million on his own account and ended up with four researchers, full-time day trading stocks, um, and he'd regularly make 300,000 on a good day, 80 to 100,000 on average. And there's a reason you need to understand this, okay? First of all, is to stop all of this minimum wage mentality, right? So I know there's this thing where we're supposed to say, I got into it for the love of trading, but actually, no, you probably got into it for the money, right? So if you want to earn $1,000 a day, that's okay, don't be shy about that. You know, don't be shy about that, right? If you don't want to go into a prop firm and you want to earn a thousand dollars a day and you want to build yourself your own account to that point, it is possible, right? Now, if you consider how much time and effort you're going to put into this, there should actually be a decent reward. Plus, as you're putting in this time, taking it seriously and putting in all that effort every day, it's going to be a lot easier to stay on track if you have your sights set on a decent goal. Right, but much more importantly than that, if you consider this curve, do you think the skills to earn two, three hundred dollars a day are the same as those that see you get into this point where you're actually cornering 30% of a market or making a hundred thousand a day? 
You know, do you think it's just the same method scaled up? And of course it isn't, right? Now the other thing is, who is teaching traders to corner a market like that? You know, to get to the point where they are 30% of all contracts traded each day. Because I know the few firms I've been where they've got somebody like that, they're kind of in awe of the guy. Nobody's actually taught that. There's no class for that. There's no course on the internet. So from my experience, talking to traders doing this, there is absolutely nobody that teaches them that skill. It's just where they ended up. Now, how does that happen? Well, of course, first of all, these are exceptional individuals, right? They're the one percenters. They're the Tiger Woods, right? But at the start of their careers, they were given trading techniques. But more importantly, they were given the knowledge and tools to become self-sufficient, to see edges in the market and exploit them, to develop as traders themselves. And when they developed, they just got way further than anybody else. So they weren't looking to be spoon-fed setups from someone. They weren't looking to be sitting in a trading room watching someone trade. They were given the tools and the knowledge to grow. And obviously, some grew into absolute monster traders. Now, they're the rare exception. I'm not saying that's the norm at all. You know, like not every golfer is going to be Tiger Woods. And this is trading. So no matter how much, you know, you want to just learn a technique from someone and not be bored with the details of how it works, that is never going to cut it long term. OK, now none of this makes your task of becoming a trader more difficult. You know, for many, it's just pointing them in the right direction of where you should actually focus to develop as a trader. So let's move forward and, and start to look at our two week plan, which is going to put you on the same path as the traders that were able to develop independently and cut all of this reliance on other people. Now, the first step in our two, two week plan is to figure out the best fit market and time to trade, which is something a lot of people don't consider. So first of all, you're not going to get profitable on replay, right? Or rather, if you get profitable replaying the US mornings, but you're not actually available to trade then, what's the long-term plan? You know, you can't give up your day job because of your replay profits. So the best thing to do is to find a market to trade when you have free time. And that's not rocket science. You know, most people are working, so if you're working, it's the rest of the time you have to trade. So in the US evenings, there are Asian markets you can focus on. Uh, for those on the West Coast, you might have to wake up a little bit earlier. You know, you can wake up 6.30 a.m. to trade the open. Um, and in my experience, for most people who've got a day job, two hours a day is a good target. And that's not an insignificant amount of time. And after our two weeks, we're actually going to add some review time onto that two hours a day. Now, my personal feeling is that any more than two hours a day, for someone that's working, it's really overkill. You know, there needs to be some balance, and, and two hours is a lot of time to be intensely focused on something. So you're going to need time afterwards to unwind too. So you find your two hours a day, and if it's four days a week or three days a week or five days a week, that's fine. And based on that, you're going to have a range of markets to choose from. You then need to narrow that down based on two factors. First of all, which of the markets available has the sort of volatility profile you like? So do you like a fast market or a slow market? And second, which of them is likely to give you multiple setups in your two hour period? Because to get good at something, you need to repeat it. So one trade a week is not gonna cut it. You would need to have superhuman patience to wait a year without changing or tweaking your setup in any way to get enough statistics to evaluate a once a week trading strategy. Now, I get trouble, I get problems trying to get people to go five days without changing their setups. So you need repetition because you need feedback as soon as possible to tell if what we're doing is working out. Now, we also know it is possible for edges in the market to disappear. So we don't want to spend two years finding an edge because we might find it and then it disappears. You know, we want to work an edge, um, find an edge, work it and always be on the lookout for other edges. Now, it doesn't mean that your edge is going to disappear because it's quite unlikely at this stage that your your ability to recognize patterns in the market is going to be fine tuned enough to even see a temporary edge come and go in the market. We will look at those later. You know, you're gonna be a lot more uh, whack-a-mole trader than a refined sniper trader when you start. So things like volume spikes, momentum moves, iceberg orders, you know, trading steps on the volume profile, big obvious things where there's admittedly more competition to trade in those areas 
are areas where you'll likely start off. The more subtle stuff, that, that's going to come later. Now, let's backtrack a little, um, because what actually do we mean by a setup, or, or what makes a good setup? Now, a lot of the traders I meet, they come to me with very, very, very complex systems they're trying to trade. So what they've built is like effectively it's like a large decision matrix of many factors. And you'll recognize these, you know, like daily charts, um, day open types, long term volume profiles, uh, Fibonacci, support and resistance, etc., cetera, et cetera. So usually what they've got is a combination of factors from smart people on the Internet. Um, and they've kind of put those together. And there's a thought process that says, the more of these things they kind of include, the better. So if long-term volume profiles work, then long-term volume profiles with day types must work better. So a number of facts are used and, and to basically to form an opinion on the market. So when I talk to them and, uh, about what they're doing and, and what, you know, what is it you, what is it make, you, you, what is it you decide? How do you decide to get in a, a trade? They'll say something like, you know, well, I thought the market was trying to do X, so I did Y. And then that, that trying to do part, it's really open-ended. It's not categorized. And because there's all these factors that are brought together, it's fairly inconsistently arrived at opinion of where the market is heading or where it will turn around. And it's very discretionary, which is fine, but it's really open-ended. And it effectively allows them to have an opinion on the market pretty much all the time, right? But if you think about it, if you, and this is true for everyone, if you or any trader has an opinion on the market all the time, it's going to be wrong quite a lot of the time. Now, the second part of the approach, you know, they say the first part is I thought the market was trying to do X. And the second part is, so I did Y. Well, that part also is just as unstructured in terms of, you know, where to get in, how to manage the trade. I think it's trying to do this, so I, I just bought here. So the whole framework that they're trading effectively lets them trade how they want, anytime they want, without any real structure. But it feels like being a trader, right? First of all, you're using all this smart stuff that really smart people on the internet told you was good. You're using lots of stuff. You are multidimensional. You are layering in multiple elements. But they're just not making any money because it's not consistent. So you could actually take two exactly the same days, 10 days apart, and make up completely different stories about them. Because they're really, you know, you can you can use that whole framework to, to say, oh, it's going up or it's, it's trying to go up or it's trying to go down. Because for all the factors they're taking into account, they've effectively created a framework that allows them to trade any time at all. So when I talk about a setup, I'm talking about using something a bit more rigid, something that kind of limits the amount of decisions you can make. Also, something higher frequency, something with less factors to take into account, something where you're not trying to guess you know, what the bigger picture outcome of the market is on that day. But the absolute limits for this two-week plan are you can only look at one market and you can only look at one setup in that market. And, of course, this is where people think, oh, man, to hell with that guy in his opinion. But this is an improvement process, right? If you've got 10 setups now, just focus on one for the two weeks and see what happens, right? Because basically what people are doing, by having all these different opinions, you've got like, you know, potentially an unlimited amount of setups you're trying to trade. And if you're not making money on 20 setups or you're just trading off the cuff with no plan, um, you just need to consider the, the benefits of scaling back a bit and, and becoming an expert in one thing. And, and in this case, just do it for two weeks and see what happens. So if you're not making money now, one setup, if you can't make money on one setup, you will not make money on five, right? Uh, and you won't make money trading like a general opinion of where the market might end up. Now, remember, this is a journey. Like the, the slide I showed you about the, the rate of progression and, and where prop traders can go, that profitable is not the end game, right? It's just a milestone on the way. And the sooner you can get to that, the better. So the setup you're going to use is basically something you've observed in the market that you believe causes a reaction. And I say believe because a lot of people, they don't really know with 100% certainty whether it works, okay? But that's where we're going to get you after the two weeks. Now, if you don't have a setup, 
choose something with a cause and effect, you know, like these things here. So fading icebergs, just jumping on momentum on crude oil, you know, uh, break out some small ranges, volume spikes. And if it's indicators and candlestick patterns, fine, absolutely fine. No problem with that at all. So step three of your two week plan is this. Now, I know, I know nobody likes me now, but you're going to have to stop trading for two weeks. OK, now let's just stop here for a second. I want you to just go back to when I opened that slide, right? And just quickly review what came into your head when I said this, right? So I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. Now, many of you, when you saw that stop trading, will have felt some kind of shock, some kind of revulsion, some kind of maybe thinking I'm an idiot, uh, or at least some kind of negative reaction to that idea. So, you know, when you think about what you were, you know, what came into your head when you saw that, you know, don't associate that with negativity. Just kind of being a, like a, a, a an independent observer of how you reacted. It's not a good reaction or a bad reaction. It's just a reaction. Now, I know people react negatively to this because I've taken many traders through this process, and this is the thing they have the most trouble with. And the reason is, they equate clicking buy and sell to trading. They equate clicking buy and sell to working right to progressing so even trades that have gone nowhere in five years they still feel this way that if they're not clicking buy and sell then there's an issue that then they can't be improving and it's very problematic because we actually need to discover if the edge works without trading it and i'll give you an example why so let's say you go to racetrack you go to horse racing track and this uh, random stranger gives you a tip on a horse the odds are 20 to 1 so it seems unlikely that a horse is going to be a winner. Now, would you put $20,000 on that horse to win? Well, probably not. It's a lot of money, right? I mean, it certainly is for me. It's four handbags for my wife. Plus, you'd have to wonder, what is this guy's motivation for telling you, right? Perhaps he wants people to bet on one horse so the odds on his horse get better. So you've basically got, all you've got is uh, buy that horse or, or, or bet on that horse. And for a lot of traders, that's exactly what they're doing, that somebody's told them a setup or they've got it online, but they've got no evidence it works and they've got no reason it should work, just some rules that someone else defined that they purchased but never really got to trust. Now, let's take a different scenario. You're still at the racetrack. Your friend comes up to you and tells you his cousin is the trainer of one of the horses and that he's drugged the other horses. And it also has one horse so amped up on amphetamines they're having trouble keeping him still enough to get the jockey on him. In addition to that, they have sniper nests set up to take out any horse ahead of your horse, and they've paid a judge to disqualify any horse the snipers miss and finishes in front of yours. Now, would you put $20,000 on that horse to win? And of course, yes, you'd end up in jail for conspiracy, but obviously, you've got a very different probability of a win. And it's the same with trading. The large percentage of losing traders are making bets where they have absolutely no idea of the outcome, right? So sometimes they're trading what someone told them to do, what they read off the internet, or even their own combination of things they've gathered from various places and put together themselves. Now, that's fine. Nothing wrong with it. These factors might be absolutely perfect, right? You might have bought a technique that is profitable, right? So the factors, or in fact, let's not call them factors, let's call them uh, market influencers, right? Things that influence market behavior. So your list of what influences the market might be fantastic, spot on. But the training rules, well, it's actually a bit early to build training rules. So by defining training rules on how to trade, you actually create a narrow expectation of what those influences will bring to the market. So you've narrowed down the potential results far too soon. So let's say you're right about the factors that influence the market. The rules put boundaries around those influences and can strangle them, that expect them to only influence the market in a certain way. So why is that? Well, there's some confusion over what an edge is. In fact, you know, when I was uh, when I was beginning, you know, I looked at webinars and people tried to describe the nature of an edge, and I always came away scratching my head. But basically, really simple terms, 
And Edge is being able to see something occur in the market in time to be able to exploit it. And of course, we are talking about repeatable edges, right? So it has to be repeated, not just something different every time. Now, being able to see something doesn't necessarily define how you'll trade it, right? So what we have, we have things that influence the market. So these are factors that we think create moves in the market. And we have trading rules to exploit the results of those influencing factors. And we combine these because we think that's the edge, but there's something missing, right? And the missing piece is simply understanding the reaction caused by these influencing factors, right? Without that, the trading rules are nothing more than guesswork. And now you might say, well, that's kind of stupid, right? If I buy, let's say I buy when I see a, an iceberg on the bid side, right? I'll, I'm buying that because I expect that bid side iceberg to make the market go up. And I do agree with that to an extent, but what's the scope of the move typically? Is it three ticks? Is it five ticks? Is it 50 ticks? What's the failure rate? You know, what are the other factors that help or hinder the trade? And many traders have these influences and they have rules, but they don't really understand the reaction to those influencing factors. In fact, there's some cases where if they'd studied this in detail and not for long, I'm not talking about a year of study, it's not a PhD, right? They would find the influencer is there, but the failure of the setup is a much stronger edge. So even if you're convinced in this case of like a bid side iceberg, you're convinced that someone is trying to hold the market. You might find that betting against them is a better strategy than joining them, right? So think about this scenario. Let's say we win nine times out of 10 and uh, the losers loses 500 ticks. There's no edge in that, right? So out of every 10 trades, you lose 500 ticks, but you make 450. So if you sim traded this, you'd be disappointed. But what if you changed it to trade against the setup and scale into your trade. So the 50 ticks is your stop loss and the 500 is your target and the winning trades are going to be much bigger than your losers because you scale in. Now that might sound like a silly example, but it's just there to understand that you really need to understand not just the setup, but what happens when that setup occurs. And this is why so many people aren't making it with traders. They find the rules and trade them but they don't have any expectation of the outcome. They just use the P&L to tell them what the outcome was. So in your two week plan, you've got the setup, you've got the time of day. For two weeks, all you're gonna do is observe that behavior, observe that setup for two weeks, right? And it's just for a couple of hours a day. And during that time, you don't have to go and uh, look for new setups. You don't have to watch any trade videos. You don't have to go on any trading courses. You're literally just letting the market talk to you. So you're looking to see in real time how often that setup occurs, what the outcomes are, what else was going on, like news, market state, that kind of thing, what correlated markets were doing. Now, make notes, but you make the sort of notes you'll be able to use afterwards. If you're a statistician, create statistics. If you're more artistic, create no, it's just create what you're comfortable with. And the key here though is not to judge or have any expectations. You have to be an impartial observer, right? So you're gathering intel on the setup so that you can then define the rules to trade. Now, of course, you're gonna be tempted to click buy and sell, and that will guarantee or oh, well, I would say almost guarantee. I've not seen anybody do it yet. Uh, trade it and make it work. But from what I've seen, it will guarantee the process fails. And the issue is that even if you've got a valid edge in the market or you've just got an edge, you've just got this set of trading rules, you bought it off the internet, some guy seems really smart, it's giving you trading rules, it's got an edge in it, but you don't know it well enough to trade it. You're not um, not experienced enough. So you're expecting a very specific outcome that works if you trade in a very specific way. And the problem is with every trade you make, right, you're gonna be getting emotional feedback and it's gonna send you through highs and lows. So every losing trade is gonna make you feel bad and every winner is gonna make you feel good. But as you haven't really uh, traded this setup before, as you haven't really honed your execution skills, you're gonna lose a lot more than you win and you're gonna lose a lot more than the setup uh, is, is giving you in terms of winners too. So you'll end up with a lot more negative feedback than positive. 
okay? And you're not gonna enjoy that at all. So even when you um, do know a setup well enough to trade it, you're still gonna suck when you start executing it, right? You just need practice execution so your execution comes close to gaining what the edge has on offer. So you are guaranteeing that even with the best setup, if you trade this, you will fail, right? Because you'll judge it by PL, you'll judge it by the losers, and you'll never know to get that set up well enough in terms of expectancy because you keep trying to execute. And you guarantee that you're, when you dismiss this, it's going to be an emotional dismissal and not an intellectual one. Now, with the people I talk to, um, what I do usually, and, and this isn't a paid service, so I'm not trying to sell you something here. This is just me um, working with people because I enjoy it, right? What I usually do when I'm, I'm talking to someone about this, I usually help them to choose something to look at. So a lot of people um, have preferences already. So we'll go through the likely candidates of, of how they want, you know, what they want to focus on and, um, you know, maybe help them to choose. Some people have setups they really believe in and we start there. Uh, some have nothing, but they're really the exception. And even with somebody who's got nothing, it's not hard to give them a place to start. Now, one trader I, I did this with, one of the first trades I did this with, um, he was looking at trading small ranges on a volatile market and, and kind of playing those ranges, uh, you know, top to bottom. And after a week, he came back and said, Pete, you know, by the look of it, from what I can see, the break of the range is going to be a lot more predictable and tradable than the fade in the range. You know, he said, I can see breaks setting up a lot of the time, and I think that's where the edge is. And he said to me, do you think it would be okay if I traded that? And it shows you how beaten up a lot of traders are. So they're seeing something in front of his own face, but not believing it or needing kind of somebody to give him the okay before he got the confidence to go to the next step with that particular setup, right? But when people do this process of analyzing a setup for a couple of weeks, the feedback is generally that they can't quite believe what they're seeing, right? This is some kind of magic trick that, you know, it can't actually work in the real world, you know? Like, how, how is it, you know, how is it I just did three years and got nowhere, and in two weeks I'm able to see this, right? Why couldn't I see this before? Or how could it be that simple, right? And the fact is, the reason you couldn't see this before is you kept clicking buy and sell. If you remove that from the equation, you remove the emotion of the losers. It's still not guaranteeing you'd be profitable, but it does show you that there is an edge there and it is possible, right? Now, the comment here um, is very typical, right? So by observing neutrally, he's not only seen that setup has potential, he's also seen some other facts he thinks will help. And it's quite depressing when you think about it that traders spend years getting nowhere and yet can see these things in a few weeks. Now, these statistics from a trader, again, trader that was not making any money, right? And he'd be put in a few years. And this was the end of his two, two weeks, two hours a day, um, looking at the markets in the US morning. Uh, I think it was 8.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Uh, based on a very, very simple setup uh, on the ultra bonds. Now, that wasn't my preference. I'm like, oh, that's probably not volatile enough. Um, but this was his setup. And I'm not going to say, well, you can't do that one. Um, so I did help him kind of choose this one to focus on, but mostly because it was what he wanted to do. So I'm just like, well, okay, that sounds good. And that was my contribution. But the key thing here, this guy was not profitable, right? This guy had was frustrated. He had no idea to, where to click buy and sell. And he was doing what a lot of people do, looking at many different systems. He wasn't focused on trade frequency. He wasn't focused on a, a consistent time of day. He was trying to find lots and lots of setups to trade, trying to find an opinion on the market. Now, we can see here how often the setup appeared each day and uh, how often it failed, right? Um, for a two-hour interval, to me, on ultra bonds, that's a pretty good frequency. Now, the ticks profit here are all theoretical, and they're all based on what would have happened if he'd entered with market orders at the point he could identify the setup. So there's no optimistic fills here. So what we have is about 240 ticks of profit available trading, and if that's trading one contract at a time, uh, on ultra bonds, it's $32 and change per tick. And that's that's pretty decent. Now, will his execution get the 240 ticks? Absolutely not at first. But that's just showing you what is potentially available. Now, imagine going from five years of going nowhere in trading and then having this in front of you after two weeks. Actual evidence over a sample of 63 trades 
or potential trades, right, that there's an actual edge in something you're looking at, right? You're not profitable yet, but you can clearly see an apparent edge. This is something you can work with. This is something that will give you confidence, right? This is another one, different person, completely different technique, just as he started to build them, right? And having statistics like this, one of the things I've noticed, it really gives people their confidence back, right? Suddenly, they know how to look at a market. They've, they've got value from a, a particular approach. They know how to assess a setup. They have a, a degree of confidence that the market has previously beaten out of them. And most people are noticing other things too, things they wouldn't have noticed on a losing SIM trade. If you lose a SIM trade, you kind of take your eyes off the screen. You say, I oh, forget about it. I, I'm not worried about it. I'm just, just doing something silly. Right, so you kind of blinker to what happens after that losing SIM trade. You don't really want to keep looking at it. You want to forget about it, right? If you observe a behavior fail, there's no reason you wouldn't exa examine those failures, right? You, you know, why not? You're not, you've got no commitment to it. You've got no involvement in that setup failing. You're coming into this two-week observation period with zero expectations, just a behavior to observe. And in this case, the trader, you know, he's seeing signs of failure before it occurs and actually thinks that with this trader, he thinks the one setup might be two separate setups with uh, with both with merit. You know, just like the trader who thought his range trade should actually be a breakout just because they were watching the market for the first time. Now, of course, the worst case scenario we come across is we find the behavior is insignificant. And that's unusual because people that do this um, with me are usually looking at the same kind of things I am so I can kind of give them a nudge in the right direction if I think it, or, or the, what I think is the right direction. But you know, you can't be in the game of um, insisting people do things they don't want to do. So if somebody wants to look at something that I think is a bit kind of wacky or odd, that's absolutely fine, right? Anyone that shows the desire to really forge their own pathing trading probably has a decent chance of making it better than somebody who says, oh yes, Pete, I'll do that, right? Plus it's this act of observing itself that's the game changer for people more than the specific setup they're looking at. Um, and, you know, and there are times when the behavior is there um, and they just see, look, I can see it, but there's only two ticks in it. Or by the time I'm seeing it, uh, it's really too late to make any money. And, you know, and, and, and that's fine, right? They, you know, that's absolutely fine. But it's still the first time they will have gotten to really know the outcome and to, to understand truly what it means to know the outcome, to understand without doubt if something has potential or not, to understand how powerful it is to observe without trading. And they know exactly what to do when they get the next trade idea. Now, at the end of the two weeks, you can start to define some rules to start sim trading, right? You're not ready to go live yet. And I know there's a lot of people that say sim trading is useless, but there's a very good reason you're not ready to go live yet. All you know at this point is you know the uh, the potential uh, p l or the potential number of ticks you can get if your execution is perfect. But of course, your execution won't be perfect to start with. You will suck. This is normal, okay? But the next step basically is to look at the results and try and figure out the execution rules. Now, you might have something where the win, win rate isn't particularly high, but the risk reward ratio is good. And in that case, the market might push you into different approaches to scaling into a trade so that your winners end up larger than your users. Now, you might not want to scale into a trade, but sometimes it's kind of beyond your control, right? And edging the market might require a certain approach to scaling, and you kind of have to respect that. So I get a lot of traders, they try to impose their will on the market. They say, you know, oh, I want to find an easier way to trade. That's pretty common. But also, I just want to trade one lot. And the problem is that sometimes the market doesn't really care what you want. So if you found an opportunity, but it's break even with an all in, all out strategy, you're not going to be able to force it to work this way. So I do understand that trading multiple contracts is beyond some people's comfort zones, um, not to mention beyond some people's account sizes. So if you do find yourself with an edge, you can't execute on the futures markets, then there are other instruments you can trade. So for a lot of the commodities and index futures now, um, there are ETFs that you can trade that, uh, that move in sync with them. So with an ETF, you could scale in 50, 10, 20 shares at a time, you know, with much lower risk per scale than in the futures markets. You know, for those outside the US, you've got different instruments like CFDs and spread bets. You could even trade binaries. You know, for most of you, this isn't going to be an issue. But just consider that, you know, 
let the market guide you. Let the, let that uh, those results guide you in terms of how you're going to execute, and just keep an open mind because because it's not all, it's not just all in all out. You know there, there are other ways to to approach, and you know depending on the you know the the risk reward on the trades, you might find that scaling in is, is a much better opportunity than all in uh, all in on all out. So the observation drives the rules, and the rules drive your plan. Now, what's also in your plan at this point is going to be review time, and that's time you set aside every day to go over your trade and behavior. Now, I know you all know, you've seen loads of webinars where you tell you to do this, and I know people don't like doing it, but you're going to be comparing the edge and the execution. So, as we've discussed, the P&L is definitely not the best measure if you're just starting to trade something for the first time, right? So, you're going to need to look at the results in terms of how the edge in the market worked and how well you traded it, right? And that's going to take some time each day and probably with two hours of trading, it's going to take you about 30 minutes and you need to make that part of your routine. And then you get onto SIM. Now, at this point, it will really help to get somebody else involved in your trading. Now, I know a lot of people are not comfortable with this. So I speak to a lot of traders, right? And uh, I know a lot of married men that are hiding the results of their trading from their wives. Now, sometimes that's because they're spending a lot of time and they're not getting anywhere and they're scared their wife's going to say, look, enough, stop. But in a number of cases, I've speak, spoken to guys and, um, and it is mostly men that are trading. You know, there are some women, but they seem to be a bit more level headed. Um, I've met men that are, that are hiding major losses from their wife. I spoke to a trader recently. He says, you know, my wife doesn't know I've lost $25,000. Um, now, why would you get somebody else involved? Well, first of all, there is a difference between what you're doing now and what you've done in trading before, right? So the traders I've worked with that have done this have been very surprised at the results, partly because they're used to spending a lot of time with no improvement at all. So making improvements in a few weeks kind of out of line with their experience, but partly because they now appear to have something in their hands that works by their own observations, and that's a first for many people. So for those that have been hiding their trading, it's a good idea to get somebody else involved that you can report the results to. You haven't really got to worry about this is another year of not getting anywhere. So you're going to tell somebody what your sim trading is going to be based on. You're going to show them the, your edge. This is what I'm going to try and trade. Um, because if you don't, you're going to find old bad habits coming back in, which in particular, trading off plan, changing the method, and you stop documenting the edge. And as a retail trader, it's pretty normal to pick up some bad habits. And something as simple as sharing the results with somebody else once a week is going to really, really help be helpful. It's going to make you accountable to somebody. It's a bit like a AA for traders. Now, there's two ways to do this. One is to tell your spouse if you're married and still talking to your spouse. Another is to find a fellow trader going through the same process. So there's a concept that um, entrepreneurs use a lot that, um, that, that I've, I've seen many times, probably a Tony Robbins kind of thing. Uh, it's a concept of having an accountability partner. It's not a trading thing. And you can look it up online. But basically, the general process of an, working with an accountability partner is you have a weekly call, and in that call, you take 15 minutes, right? You detail what your plan was for the previous week, um, what you've actually done, what the results were, and what you plan to do the following week. And after you've done that, you end the call. And then immediately after, you have a second call, and the other person does the same thing. Now, there are reasons, and it's probably beyond the scope of this, that you do two separate calls. It just seems to work better that way. Now, a lot of you thinking, yeah, 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 well, I'll do the two-week study, but, you know, just forget about this, which is fine, but the more tools you give yourself to make this work, the higher your probability of success. So all prop traders, every single prop trader is accountable to someone, right? If you make yourself accountable to nobody, you're going to be relying a hell of a lot on your own willpower to behave well. But anyway, whether you do or not, you continue documenting that edge and you continue trading it. What you don't do is change the rules because that's a reset and it puts you back to the start. And some traders 
they just love to change stuff. They like to change the charts, change their time frames, their trading rules, their approach, and it varies from person to person, obviously. And um, but with the sort of plan we're discussing here, it's all about consistency, right? If you do one week of analysis and change the rules, you are absolutely throwing away that first week's work. And it doesn't matter if you say, yeah, but I'm I'm only changing this. It's a reset, right? So you just have to, it's, it's a black and white thing, right? You don't change anything, right? And what I'm sharing with you here are actual communications I had with somebody going through this process. So I spent an hour with this guy and discussed his two week plan. All agreed, no problems. We got the setup. He knows exactly what he's got observed for a few hours a day. And he knows he should chill out, relax for the rest of it, right? You don't have to beat yourself up by trading. It's not, you know, it's, you're not flogging yourself here, right? So he had a decent setup to follow. And I thought, there's, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that the trade location is going to help him discover something, even if it's not the edge he's investigating. So as you can see from the spreadsheet, very, very diligent in recording the results. But there's a little issue here, right? You see this? It says primarily without trading. Okay. It wasn't live, but it was trading on SIM. But why? Well, I think because we feel if we're not clicking buy and sell, then we're not progressing. So this trader could not bring himself to have two weeks away from clicking the buy and sell buttons. So now I got an email from him for the first three days and everything was great, right? Not only could he do the observation part, he could trade it too because he could do so when it would have no impact, right? So of course, when I saw this, I'm thinking, oh brother, right? But I didn't reply because at the end of the day, you know, I'm not his auntie. I'm not his school teacher. You know, we all have to do what we think is right. I'm not here to push people around. I can, you know, I work with people kind of, I work with people doing this kind of more for enjoyment than anything else. It's kind of lonely um, trading on your own. But after day three, emails were becoming a bit less positive. And on day eight, I was blessed with not one, but two emails. And in the first one, He's basically fighting the market. And at this point, I'm not actually sure if he still thinks he's following the two week plan to some extent or not. Right. I mean, I don't really is I don't really know if he thinks he's following the plan. I mean, maybe it's just changed a little bit each day, little by little until it's become completely unrecognizable. Anyway, so somehow we've gone from observe one setup for two hours a day to blowing up an account just in eight trading days. Right. Now, also note the comment in, uh, at the top here about him being in the top 10 on the Jigsaw leaderboard, which somehow became one of his goals. And, that, and again, that seems slightly off scope to me. And then the frustration email comes and he's suddenly looking for another trading method. The trouble is, if he finds that other trading method, guess what? If he starts to trade it, he won't trade it well initially. He's got no idea what the expectation of that setup is. So round and round and round in circles he goes. So how did we get here? How did we get from two weeks of focused observation to I need to change my whole method, right? So he's looking at Mr. Gecko, and he's a regular winner on the Jigsaw leaderboard, a trader that scales into trades, works in a prop firm, and has a lot of trading experience. So this trader wants some of that, right? He's looking at videos of other traders, and he wants what they've got too. And of course, the grass is always looking much greener from where you're standing and from where this guy's standing with his approach of, well, actually, I'm not even sure what his approach was. So at this point, it's intervention time. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you can't make money on one market, I really can't say how you can make money on two. Now, I could be wrong about that. But all prop traders start off with a very narrow focus and then like Mr. Gecko, they grow into more accomplished traders. So you can spend five years trying to make $5,000 a day or you can spend a few months trying to make a hundred, trying to just get a small profit. And I don't know any way to shortcut this, right? It doesn't matter what stage any other trader is at. They are not you and you can't buy their experience. What you can do is you can improve your own experience if you take things one step at a time. Now, the good news is this guy got it in the end, right? We had a chat after this, and he's now got past the two weeks of observation. He's on to the execution phase. You know, but his nature, his very nature, 
is to keep changing things. And he's actually working with a psychologist to change that part of his behavior because he can see the impact himself. And the thing is, this guy doesn't lack intelligence. This is a smart, successful businessman. But we all have our demons. Okay, so, so far what we've done is pretty simple, right? Now think about your, first, your, your typical retail trader in their first week of trading, right? If you gave somebody in their first week of trading a legitimate edge, what do you think they'd do with it? So they'd try to execute that edge, but their execution wouldn't be very good. And that edge would appear to not work. And that's simply because they would have one measurement, profitable or not. So of course, they would not be profitable even with an edge. It takes some time to hone those execution skills. And if you can't distinguish between a problem with your edge and a problem with your execution, it's not going to be evident which of those is the cause of losses when you look at the P&L. So you need to build trust in the edge. And that's the same whether you found an edge yourself or you got it from someone else. Now, I don't need to explain why because everybody's experiences themselves. Um, you know, the doubt, that kind of doubt that comes in when something starts to not work and just and how you start scrambling around and looking for something else. Now, a lot of you will be wondering if two weeks is enough. Well, two weeks is obviously not enough to see an edge in all market conditions. But by the end of two weeks, you can have some idea of how valid that edge is. But more importantly, you'll have observed a lot of nuance in the market. And your original idea of what the edge is and what you now know that edge to be are very likely to be two completely different things. But not only that, you're now developing pattern recognition skills that you didn't have before. As an impartial observer with no stake in the outcome of a setup, you're able to view the action without any emotional commitment or involvement. So you'll see things that you wouldn't see if you had that emotional stake in the outcome. So when you get to week three, the start of sim trading, those new skills are going to stay with you. You will now be able to continue documenting that edge as at the same time you start trading it. So let me repeat that. Your analysis, your documentation of that edge does not stop. It needs to continue. The only difference is you're now executing it as well. Now, there are edges in the market that come and go. Um, you know, recently I was chatting with a trader and he mentioned someone, you know, kept, oh, there's this guy, he keeps putting 200 lots on crude, keeps putting 200 lots on crude, and it had been going on for a few days. And I said to him, well, what's the reaction? What's happening when they hit the market? And he said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. I'd just seen him, you know, seen them, seen them do it. And, um, you know, this is, this is effectively what some of these temporary edges are, you know. Um, if you've seen something like that and you can see the reaction, uh, reaction uh, that might just be a temporary edge and it might just be there for a few days. Um, but a lot of prop traders, you know, when they get to these elite levels, that's what they're trading on. So what you're doing in the first two weeks, you're partly validating the edge you think you have, but partly you're changing your mindset because almost always the trader sees something they didn't expect. So the mindset change is to really appreciate that observation of market behavior. So the question of is two weeks enough is answered in a couple of ways. First of all, if your edge is temporary, you don't want to spend a year, um, you know, watching it come and go. Second, the concept of separating edge and execution is now with you. So as you move forward, you are now equipped to deal with the two separately. So even if the edge fades, you're going to be able to see that. And third, you know, we do two weeks because you actually need to move forward, right? Nobody wants to watch the markets for months, right? You have to go.
views. Um, so I think we can end the webinar there. So thank you for coming. Peter, are you there? Oh, there you go. Peter. There you go, Terry. <laughs> I have I'm not no, sure if we had some audio issues. I have no idea what happened. I lost the internet there for a moment. Okay. Okay, let's see. Okay, yeah, all okay, I'm back. There we go. There you go. All right, let's see. Q and A. I'm trying to see if there's any questions mixed in with all the comments. Mm -hmm. I did this two week plan exactly, but when I started actually trading, I found that I wasn't able to execute profitably on the behavior that I observed. What should I do now? Um, well, it's kind of hard without seeing the, the behavior itself. Um, I mean, there's a couple of reasons that you might have that. Is first of all, you might be a bit optimistic when you're doing the observation because one of the things about the observation is you've got to be able to say, right, this is where I saw it, and and this is where it happened. And if you kind of going, if you're if you kind of seen something a little bit after the event and then going uh, back to the event, you know, kind of say, well, I would have seen it then. Obviously, that's going to be a challenge in execution, but um, it's it's really a case by case. I mean, if you if you do that, you're more than welcome to. Um, to contact me, email me, we can go through it on Skype. Um, but it's kind of case by case thing. I'd need to have a look. But you might want to, there might be uh, might be an opportunity to scale, for instance. Um, but it's kind of difficult to know without knowing the, the details. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can I document more than one setup during the two weeks? You can, but I mean, you, you, I mean, you absolutely can. But I wouldn't go for like five or six. But at the end of the day, you're going to be sitting there for two hours, and if your setup's only going to come on once an hour, then you might be better off with it with a couple. But what also could happen is you might look at one behaviour, and that turns into two setups. So one of the things just just be aware of is that you're going to see more things than you're looking for. But um, you know, for, for me, I would prefer people to look at one. Um, but if it's two because you don't have the frequency, I really don't see a problem with that. Um, but, you know, the, the, the less you do, if you, if you try and bite off more than you can chew, um, it's just putting roadblocks, in, putting obstacles in front of yourself. Okay. Uh, I do not have what I would call a good trading plan. How would I find one? But again, it did, what I would say, the best way to... <clears throat> For anybody who's, who's, who doesn't have a good trading plan, I would say, what I say to people is, what is it you've done before in trading? What is it you were attracted to? Um, which markets did you like to trade? Um, you know, what what techniques resonated with you? Uh, and just go back over the thing, the different things you've done, and so well, what you know, what actually made sense. Doesn't matter whether it worked for you or not, because the, the fact it might not work just might be your execution. But um, you need to just have a review of you know, what you've done before. So if you can pull something out of what you've done before and say, look, I'm going to focus on this. It seemed to have merit. And then just use that. And, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a working setup or not because the, this, this observation thing is going, to, is going to pull things out of the market you haven't seen before. But if you're truly starting, um, truly starting afresh, then I'd just go and, I'd go and find something online, find something online that looks worthy. Or find an educator you actually really trust that that, that other people are recommending that that you know that you, you can say right this guy actually has something to offer because like like in the prop firms they all have a there is a guy teaching them you know this is how the market works this is how you should react to it and you're going to need to get that from somebody right that that needs to come, whether that comes from me comes from somebody else you know um, it, it doesn't really matter but you, you're going to need something but for me. I always think people are better off with something they are comfortable with and with something that they bring to the table. Because um, otherwise, you you know, if you say, well, you know, all that stuff I did before didn't work, you know, I want to start again. You, you're really throwing away everything you've done so far. And what we're trying to do is build on top of it. Okay. What do you think about uh, shortcutting the observation time by doing back testing instead? Um. I, I don't know. I, to me, I think it's there's, there's if you look at the webinars by uh, Alex Hayward from Axia, 
He talks about building pattern recognition skills. And you're just not going to be, and so it's being able to engage with the market and recognize what's going on in the market. And if you want to build those pattern recognition skills, you're going to have to sit in front of a live market. Back testing is not going to do it for you. Um, I understand. I understand what you said. Now you could back test to find the strategy. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But like, you're going to be you're going to be missing out on a chunk of skills if you don't actually get engaged without that um, emotional involvement of sim trading. Okay. Does stack pool on Jigsaw include current executed trades? Oh, that came from nowhere, didn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, the, the pulling on Jigsaw just shows you what they've taken away from the bids and, off, bids and offers. So it just includes what's changed on the bids. But it does, but it, yeah. Well, I should I should say that. So, but if they've traded a bid, it won't include the traded amount. So, like, if they pull thirty, if, let's say there were hundred, and we traded fifty, and there's now ten there, it'll say they pulled forty. So that's a math that's a math puzzle to do in your head. Okay. Uh... As a beginner, I have gotten distracted quickly and go to do some other things. How will you improve someone or their attention span when you are only observing the market? Right. So, so for you, this is key, right? So, when when we started at the when we when we looked at the start, we talked about find a market um, that's available when you're available, and also look for the volatility profile that suits you. So, you're somebody who needs a more volatile market with more setups. So, um, for me, if I'm looking at the interest rate products, right, the the, the U.S. Treasuries, and I watch those markets. Facebook opens on its own on my other screen and takes my eyes away, right? So I just can't look at them. I can't focus on them. I know people that can. They're great markets. Nothing wrong with them. But we all have our own kind of attention span issues. And I think, like, for me, I need a faster market than those. And so it sounds like you do. So you need to just find a market that's got more action. I mean, go, at the extreme, look at the DAX, right? But um, but you just need a more active market. That's, that's the issue. You need more action. Okay. Are you talking about scaling into winning trades or trades going against you? Um, well, again, you have to, once you've done this observation, you have to let the, the way the market moves around that edge kind of dictate to you. But generally speaking, um, if, the, if it seems like it's, it's a kind of lower win rate, but it's a good risk reward ratio, you are better off scaling in or potentially better off scaling in. Um, I wouldn't advise scaling into losers, but again, there are you know if if the if the edge is there and scaling into losers is what it you know what makes it make money, then that's that's what it gives you. And if if you if that's kind of um something you don't you're not comfortable with yourself, then that edge is not for you, right? But so you, but you just have to let the market guide you. Okay, what time frame do you recommend to follow your plan? Oh, I don't even <laughs> right. So I don't really believe in time frames, which is going to sound like a really I don't know. It might sound like a silly thing to do, to say. Um, if I'm looking at chart um, as a day trader, if I'm looking at a chart, I want to be able to see everything that's happened that day. So you know, there's times a year where that's a 600 tick chart. There's times a year where that's a 900 tick chart. Um, I don't think it actually matters what time frame you use. It, all that matters is. Where's the market been, and where did it, where did the reactions occur? And I think whether that's a five minute or a one minute or a tick or whatever, to me it doesn't really matter. I, I've never really understood why it would make a difference. Okay. Uh, I have trouble sticking to the same schedule every day. What do you recommend to correct that behavior? Well, I don't think that's a behavior. You might work shifts. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, I mean, the thing is, if you if you're gonna like if you if you're at the open one day and at lunchtime the next, um, if you're an accomplished prop trader, you can do that, right? But when you start out, you've got to try and keep as many things as consistent as possible. So, if that's a behavior, then again, I would find I would you know I'd involve the wife, involve a friend. I would you know. Get you know, get somebody you can be accountable to. But it, to me, it's one of the most important things is to have a consistent time. So you're you're trading with the same participants, um, you know, each day. It doesn't mean the market's going to behave the same each day because you know 
conditions come and go but um the more things you can keep the same the better and if, if you find it's just you know if it's a behavior you just need to figure out how to um how to solve it i mean like i said one of the guys you know one of the guys i talked about he ended up going to a, a, a psychologist a guy called rich friesen um to sort his issues out though it's not it's, it's not my area of expertise but if you find it's um a behavior you can't break i have a chat with somebody about it let's see Do you recommend automated trading or manual trading? Um, I recommend discretionary trading. Um, I, I'm a developer. I'm a developer. You know, I was a programmer at 13 years old. So when I got into it, I was kind of um, swept up in all the trade station and uh, and all that kind of stuff and all the automation there. I even got a, there were even a team of four of us trying to automate stuff. And um, I found I was trying to automate something I didn't know how to do. Which is kind of first rule of developing software. So I, I had a like um, I, had a, I had a break from automation. I said, look, I, I really need to learn the ropes of trading before I go back to automation. And uh, it never going back to automation never appealed to me again. So it's not I'm not like against it. It's just it, it just doesn't interest me. I think it would um, it would dumb down everything I do to an extent. I would always have to whenever if ever I was trying to define a rule. Um, I'd always be, I'd always have to kind of dumb down the way I actually do it, and uh, I'm not sure it would actually end up in a, a system that would make money. So it's not for me. Okay. Hi, we're getting long on time. Um, thank you for the uh, webinar, for the information, and for presenting this uh, interesting idea today. If you, if the uh, listeners or watchers, if you have any uh, further questions, Pete's uh, contact information on a slide, or if you're watching us at a later time on YouTube, you can contact Pete via the email. Uh, again, thank you for the uh, webinar and for spending some time with us this evening, Pete. Uh, thanks all for thanks, Terry, and thanks all for attending. Absolutely, thank you. Bye.